Okay, so um, this is where we were, and I'm I'm done with the theory, and we will go into applications. Um, so the first thing you may need to know when you process signal with Fourier analysis is to take care of low frequencies. Uh, so first thing to do is to subtract the mean from your signal because in any case the mean, you've seen it before, it's the first element of the transform or the transform at zero so it has not any useful information and it's just the mean of your signal I mean, it's just the mean of your signal. Um, and using zero mean signals simplifies the treatment of the edges. Um, so the low frequency trends that you can have in your data that can be due to whatever contamination, for example, uh, some parasitic signal that drifts slowly over time or something like that, that tends to produce a peak near the origin. You will have, and that's what's represented by that large peak in the bro and white paper. Um, and the intensity of that peak uh, can be redistributed by the window function, uh, so it, by the sink function in the case of a square window. Uh, and that can therefore pollute your spectrum at higher frequencies. So it's um, it's possible to detrend the data prior to Fourier analysis, but you have to be very careful with that, and I will come back to that later. Um, now you need to, we've seen that your Fourier transform is considering that your signal is one period of an infinitely long periodic signal. And therefore you have usually discontinuities between the beginning of and the end because the value at the beginning and the value at the end is not the same. And these uh, discontinuities, it's one, one way to, to, to see it is that they produce frequencies up to infinity in your Fourier transform, which, which creates this aliasing here. So what you do usually to remove that is that you multiply your signal by a window function, by a masking function. So your signal is multiplied anyway by a window because it's finite in time and space. So it's multiplied anyway by a square function. So all you're doing here is multiplying it by a smoother function, a function that goes smoothly to zero at the beginning and at the end. So, and that would be the resulting function, okay? So you basically join the result is to make the ends join at the same level. And that way you can suppress the aliasing. Okay? So the discontinuities at the edge uh, create aliasing. You can minimize that by forcing a smooth transi transition at the edge. So in a way you modify your signal, but that's the way to clean up the Fourier transform. And the what that is called apodizing your signal. So apodizing means removing feet in Greek. <laughs> because it's removing the lobes, so the feet of the window function. I'll show a few examples. So I said that you, it's equivalent to replacing your square window by another window that transitions smoothly to zero. So your signal is your underlying signal time convolved by, sorry, times, that's a typo, times a window function. So there are in the Fourier space, the result is your, the Fourier transform of your signal convolved by the Fourier transform of your window function. You can have a large number of possible windowing functions. There is not a single choice. Um, generally, a wild, wide window will have good frequency resolution. A narrower window will, be, will have a wider transform. A wide window will have a narrower transform. So the choice will depend on your applications. So these are possible windowing functions and therefore it transforms. So the classic ones and the ones that I will use in the hands-on sessions is the HAN 
window that's defined by this. Um, Turkey is commonly found, uh, but you can find all these sometimes, uh, depending on your application. So this is the frequency. This is the frequency here in log scale, and the power in log scale two of various functions. So the rectangular window, so the, the square function, so the, the Fourier transform is that black curve here. Um, you see that it's the narrowest because it's the widest possible. That's the window that encompasses the whole interval of your measurement. Uh, but it is the one that has the highest lobes, the highest wings. So epodizing means removing this foot. Okay? So the, the hand function is the green one, so it would be somewhere there for the, the first lobe, and then it falls pretty quickly. So it's a good, it's a pretty good all-purpose window. And then if you are really interested in removing as much as possible the wings, you can do that by applying like the Blackman-Harris window that's, that would have this uh, Fourier response. But you see that the side effect or the, the, the counter effect is that you're widening the peak. So the more you remove power in the wings, the wider the peak gets. You cannot have both at the same time. Anyway, you can, as a first approximation, you can always use that. You can't really go wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's a good compromise for many applications. So in summary, up to now, the Fourier, you have the definition of the two uh, direct and inverse discrete transforms of discrete signals. So you have to remember that the Fourier transform is periodic and symmetric with respect to the origin and Nyquist. Okay. Your measurement is actually one period of an infinite periodic signal. Uh, so if that's if you're designing instruments. Um, subtract the mean. You can subtract low frequency trends, but be careful. And you can apodize. So if necessary, you can multiply your signal by a window function. Of course, if your signal, for example, if your signal already has the same value at the beginning and at the end, you don't need to do that because it's apodized by itself. Um, so what about unevenly spaced data? Because after that, I'm going to talk about wavelets and statistics on uh, noise in the Fourier transforms. Um, so the definition of the discrete Fourier transform still holds for unevenly spaced data, right? I mean, in here, in this expression, nothing says that anything has to be periodic. I mean, your xj can be whatever values. Um, so the, by definition, the periodogram is the power spectrum of this evenly spaced data. And if you are interested in that, I recommend that you read these two papers. Uh, that are very good uh, introductions and more on the periodogram, so on the case of unevenly spaced data, and on the statistics of the uh, power spectrum for unevenly spaced data. Read these papers before using what you can find in many software packages as a periodogram uh, routine to compute the Fourier transform of unevenly spaced data. Because the periodogram is not a magical tool that will let you violate information theory. You see that in many papers. I, I, have, I want to go beyond Nyquist, or I want to compute at finer frequencies that the, than the duration of my signal permits. You just cannot do that, even with the periodogram. Of course, you cannot beat Shannon. I mean, there is no information beyond, beyond Nyquist, period. The smoother peaks that you will get with the periodogram, because you, these packages will let you compute Fourier transforms at whatever frequencies you want, so at frequencies that are in between discrete Fourier transforms frequencies. But these, uh, these extra values that you will get contain no additional information. They are merely interpolations. 
computing uh, the Fourier transform for uh, unevenly spaced data is basically equivalent to fitting your signal by a series of sines and cosines. And if you can compute that at an infinite number of frequencies, but there is no extra information. And the choice now, there, are, there is the problem of the choice of optimal frequencies at which to compute the, uh, the periodogram. Um, that will depend on the, on the window, on the actual window with gaps that you will have on the sampling rate, and that is described in detail in there. What's important for the rest of the presentation is that the Scargill periodogram has the same statistical properties as for e evenly spaced data. So everything that I will show you from now on also applies to evenly spaced data. And that paper is a good reference also for the statistical properties of evenly spaced data, because it's basically the same thing. So if the sampling is not pathological, uh, everything that you will see after or from now on is, uh, is valid. By pathological, I would mean like uh, many points uh, at the beginning of a sequence and then one point uh, two hours later and trying to compute frequencies in ranges that are not covered by your, by your data, something like this. Anyway. Um, I can glance over that quickly because more important things are coming. So the FFT, that you need, the function that you will use most of the time to compute the DFT. I didn't talk about FFTs yet. I talked about discrete Fourier transform. So the FFT is one implementation of the DFT. You have many ways to compute the discrete Fourier transform. The FFT is only one way to compute it. Now it's a very good way to compute it, and that's why it became almost synonymous, but it's not. Um, why it's interesting? It's because if you directly compute the DFT, so if you compute that sum directly, so that will involve lots of sines and cosines, and, sum, and that will involve summing uh, lots of oscillating, rapidly oscillating function. That numerically is usually bad. And that takes uh, n squared operations, while the FFT does the same in n log n operations. So it's a good, fast algorithm. So you, for, if you have 10 points, you gain 10. If you have uh, 100 points, you gain large vectors. So it's very efficient. And you have many FFT algorithms, actually. So the most famous is Cooley Turkey, published in 65. So it's old stuff. Actually, it was already known by Gauss in 1805. <laughs> Who did things manually. Um, and it's also a very uh, smart algorithm in the way to deal with the, the rounding errors that you encounter when you sum these oscillating functions. If you sum values very close to zero, you will, you will end up with lots of rounding er errors that will creep up numerically in the result, while the, D, the FFT keep these in check, and, they have, and the FFT has a, a small error. Uh, that's of the order of square root of log n versus square root of n for the, D, for the straight DFT. Uh, I'll go over that quickly. Wavelet analysis now. So that's a straight, pretty straightforward extension of Fourier analysis. So everything we have presented um, right uh, before that basically applies to wavelet analysis. All the basic principles, uh, like the, the, the effect of sampling, the effect of windowing, all that applies to uh, wavelet analysis. So I will use the code by Torrance and Compo, and I will use the plots from their papers as illustrations. That's a very successful paper, so it's cited basically once every two days. So if one of your papers gets cited once every two days, <laughs> call me. So it, it has yeah, 2,600 citations. I've checked, it's been used in any, any sorts of things for sometimes very wrong reasons. <laughs> 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 it's, been, 
it's a very good thing. It's a very good paper. It's a very good code. Uh, read that paper. The problem with that code is that it's distributed as a black box and it produces. So the good thing is that it provides quantitative confidence levels, which is good because many applications in wavelets did not consider confidence levels when searching for periodic signals. So it was very good of them to provide that. But again, if you use a black box without understanding the inner workings of the black box, you are likely to do something wrong. So that's dangerous. So they provide, they, they use, they provide an IDL code. I think there is a Python version also. You just take it, you replace the line of code where they read their data by your data that produces something like this, and you have a, a new paper. Most of the time, it's wrong. Um, you need to compute confidence levels first that are not the ones that are in the paper, although theirs are perfectly rigorous, they are not sufficient. And also, I will talk about the background noise models that you need to use. Anyway. This being said, it's a very good paper and it's a good code, so use it, just be careful. So wavelets. Um, so in the processing of uh, time sequences, so you can imagine that your signal is non-stationary, meaning that the process, for example, a process will be sometimes uh, going on and sometimes will shut down and sometimes will go on again. And so you may have some periodic signal for some period of time and then nothing and then something again. Um, so a crude approach um, to have information on both the frequency and when something happens would be to run Fourier transforms over a running segment of your signal. Okay, you take one first segment of your signal, you run a Fourier transform and see if there is anything in there and then shift it, see if there is anything in there and blah, blah, blah. But then you have the problem of choosing the width of the segment that you choose. So you could do that over a wide number of widths and look at the results. Um, the problem is that if you have resolution in time, you have no resolution in frequency. And the, the natural way to solve the problem is to introduce wavelets. And taking the wavelet transform, so if you, sorry, if you take the Fourier transform, you are decomposing your signal on the basis of sines and cosines. If you're computing a wavelet transform, you're decomposing your signal on a basis of wavelets that are typically oscillating functions, but that, but that are not infinite in time. They are just finite in time. It's, and it's the only difference. So you, indu, you introduce a new quantity that characterizes the width or the, the temporal extent of the function and that will be used to, to investigate when something happens in your signal. So if you use a Fourier transform, because your basis of function is infinite in time, you have no information on when something happens. On, in, with wavelets, the basis functions are finite in time, and therefore you can have information on when something happens or where something happens in your signal. So this um, will be, uh, an, that's an example of, the, of wavelets, of continuous wavelets. That's the Morley wavelet that's very used in the Torrance and Compo code. They provide, uh, they provide um, code for three classes of, of wavelets, but you, can, you could have many more. Uh, because you introduce this, extra dimension, it means that you have an extra choice in parameters. And with Fourier, you cannot choose anything but the frequency, and you want to vary the frequencies from zero to Nyquist. With wavelets, you need to choose your, ba your wavelet basis, and that will depend on your application. Some wavelets will be narrow, like that one, that will have a um, higher uh, temporal or spatial resolution but that will have less frequency resolution. And vice versa, if you have a more extended wavelet in time, it will have more frequency resolution and less resolution in time or space. Um, so to be a good wavelet, your psi must have zero mean and 
should be bounded in time and frequency, meaning that it should be zero outside a range of, uh, of values for eta, which is a dimensionless time. So S is here the, the scale of the wavelet. Um, wavelets can be real or complex. And this is the definition of the wavelet transform with the TC, so Torrance and Compo 98 paper notations. So that's the sum of, so again, here it's a convention. They use the complex conjugate of the wavelet, but if you define your wavelet differently, it could be simply the wavelet itself. So it's very similar to the, uh, to the Fourier transform, except that you replace your exponential to i pi nu t by your wavelet. Okay, so you replace your sines and cosines by your wavelet function, okay? So now in this notation, you, it's the wavelet at frequency n, n scale s. It's a kind of a weird notation, but it's a, it's a function of two uh, parameters. Before, you, the Fourier transform of your signal is a function of nu, the frequency. Now it's a function of the, the frequency, so that would be n in these notations, and s, which is the scale. Okay? And actually, that can be viewed as the convolution of your xn's, which are your, your samples, with a scaled and translated version of psi. So you, by doing this sum here, you scale your wavelet, so you vary its scale, and you shift it in time to sample your uh, data at varying times and varying scales. Um, using the convolution theorem, because this is, can be viewed as a convolution, the wavelet transform can be easily computed in Fourier space by doing this, which means that it's important to master Fourier transforms before doing wavelets, because basically it's computed most of the time using Fourier transforms. Um, so the wavelet power spectrum is exactly the same, the equivalent of the Fourier power spectrum. It will be the square of the norm of the uh, wavelet transform at frequency n and scale s. Okay? And a wavelet transform would look like this. So that's from the Torrance and Compo paper. So that's the, their data is the El Nino time series. So it's temperature somewhere in the ocean or on average or whatever. I mean, it's temperature over, over time. And the wavelet transform here is this plot. So because it's a function of two variables, one way to represent it is by displaying images, right? So you have the, the gray levels here represent power at a given time and a given scale. So period here, okay? Yes? That's exactly, that's scale or period. Okay, so it means that if you, you take your wavelet psi here, that one, or the case of, of the Morley spectrum, which is that one, oop, and you convolve your signal by that function, and you vary the scale, which means you vary the, the extension of your wavelet. So for when the wavelet is very narrow, that would correspond to these points here, so the high frequencies. And when the wavelet is very wide, that would correspond to these points there. Okay? The... Fourier transform of that, uh, in a way, you can imagine that you would sum this spectrum along the temporal axis. So you lose, you remove the temporal information, take the average of this over on the temporal axis, and you get, not exactly, but you will get the time average wavelet spectrum, which kind of looks like the Fourier transform. And I will go back to that later. So this is the same for another basis of wavelets. You see that it's looks kind of different. Uh, so this is the 
dog wavelet, which is derivative of Gaussian for the, and m is the, the order of, of the derivative. So that would have uh, much more temporal resolution, because you see that the peaks are very narrow, but then they are very elongated, so you don't have, you basically lose all the information on, on the frequency if you use that. And with the Morley wavelet, it's a bit of kind of a, a good mix of temporal resolution and scale resolution. Yes? Ex yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. Yes, yes, no, no, no. It, it, you, so you, you do one scale, and then another scale, and then a, another scale. You never vary. Well, then you don't know what to do. I mean, how would you vary it? How frequently? How? Um, so here again, we are considering, yes. Yes, so the scale, these are, so this eta here is a dimensionless time. And likewise, the, the scale is a dimensionless quantity. But it's, it's equivalent in that case because this unit here is time. Scale is equivalent to period. Because it's the scale in this, it's whether a structure here, oops, sorry, is small or large. The scale for time means, means period. How long would be the structure? For example, if you have a, a narrow peak here or a broader peak there. If, if something is narrow or wide, that's the scale. No, indeed. Why? Because it depends on the total duration of your signal. So the scales will be, you will chop your signal usually in powers of two scales. So you have scale one, scale two, scale four, scale eight, or something like this. And then your period is just a conversion between that, this, and this. And here, the sixth, it's chopped compared to that one. You, you miss the last, the last part. But it depends on the, the, the conversion between period and scale is not the same. Well, it's not, it's not the same for all wavelets. And it's not an, an integer number. So that's why you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, oh no, that's, sorry, that's the plot, that's the tick marks. These are tick marks, sorry. Should be, there is no minus, it's, uh, it's just tick marks at, uh, in front of the, of the values. So it depends on what you want to do. There is no, it's like the choice of windowing function that you want to use. There is no objective criterion. It depends if you want to, the, your choice of window, it depends if you want frequency or resolution, or if you want to remove as much as possible the side lobes. Here, it will depend whether you want temporal resolution or frequency resolution, or a little bit of both. And indeed, you can get very different results. So that's the, that's the drawback of using wavelets, that you have to choose something. And that choice will depend on what you want to do. Well, if you have anything longer than 64, uh, here it's stopped at 64 years uh, because it's the half, it's basically the Nyquist frequency. It's half the duration 
and you, you won't be able, don't do it. <laughs> don't do that. You cannot see, in, in, in a time series that's 120 years long, you cannot see periods that are longer than 64 years. They are not there. You can always fit a sign through three points, like you can fit a straight line through two points. Uh, it won't be meaningful in terms of statistics. Uh, you cannot pretend that you detect a periodic signal with less than a period. This, yes. So this, um, good question. This is what Torrance, Torrance and Compo call the cone of influence. It's actually, a, this scale is actually logarithmic. It's factors of two each time. So this is actually a straight line in if that axis was uh, linear. And this is the region where you have side effects because of discontinuities at the edges. And the way Torrents and Compo treat that problem, so they don't apodize their signal. They use zero padding, which means that they extend their, they artificially extend their time series with zeros. So they, you take your time series and you put zeros here and zeros there. And so you'll have stuff going on at the edge and you can define the region where uh, these side effects will be important. And they will be important on a scale that corresponds to the scale of the wavelet. Meaning the, basically the, the time it takes for a wavelet to go from the max to, let's say, half its value. Okay? So that means that in this region here, the power is affected by what's outside. So what's outside can be the zeros that they input or what happens on the other side because it's periodic. Because again, the wavelet transform considers that your signal is one period of an infinitely periodic signal. Yes? Not no, 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 not necessarily here. It's just that the signal indeed has power around four years because it's a linear. Yeah, but here it's, you don't know where it happens. It's, it's, it's very spread. So it's, it's just leakage due to the width of the, of the wavelet. Yes, Parseval's theorem applies in both cases. So you, have, you can generalize Parseval's theorem to wavelets. I don't go over it but by lack of time, but you can, instead of summing over time and frequency, you can sum over frequencies and scales, and you, you will find back the total power in your signal. So it's, it conserves energy, so that's, that's okay. I'm going a bit quickly over the wavelets because I want to go into the noise issues, because that's the, the important things. Uh, but we can go back on that in more details, maybe tomorrow and in the hands-on. Um, so a few words on normalization. So it's, it's useful to be able to compare different power spectra, if you, because it's, that's what you want to do very often. You want to compare signals. Um, and a signal that looks like this will have a Fourier transform that looks like this, so a bunch of peaks. That's a, that's a log scale here. So remember the Parseval theorem in Fourier, okay? So the integral of f squared over dt is equal to the integral of the power over the frequencies. So indeed, you have an, inc an equivalent for zero mean signal of variance uh, sigma zero squared. And that means that the variance in your signal is the same as the average power in your Fourier transform, okay? Which provides, 
for a nice no way to normalize the, uh, your time series and your power spectra. If you normalize your time series by the standard deviation, so that's what I said, the, you have equivalent expressions for wavelets. Um, for white noise, the expectation value uh, at all frequencies, so the power that you expect in the statistical sense, so if you had a large number of realization of your time series, of your noise, the value that you expect is sigma zero squared, sigma zero squared being, being the variance of your signal at all frequencies and at all scales for wavelets. So if you normalize the power spectra to sigma zero squared, so, so you have a power spectrum that's centered on one, always. So that means that the power that you have is equivalent to comparing to your power to white noise, to that of white noise. And that's interesting if you want to detect periodic signals. You know that white, white noise should have a, neck, a mean power of one, right? So you normalize your signal by its standard deviation. If your signal is white noise, then its mean power will be one, okay? And you can compare the power that you have. I will go over that in more detail. You can compare the power at each uh, frequency to that. Uh, so we, you have to be careful about the, the way to normalize that. In ideal, that means that you have to multiply your Fourier spectrum by n, n being, being the number of points, before you divide by sigma zero squared. So again, check, check with your favorite language whether that's the right normalization, and you can verify that if you normalize your signal by the standard deviation, by its standard deviations, you should get a zero, uh, a mean power of one. Um, so again, that gives a measure of power relative to white noise, and that's the convention used in TC98, and it's also what was used by Scargill in its 80-something paper. It's, it just makes sense when you detect uh, signals to compare to, to what you expect for noise, because that's, that's the basic test. Compare the power that you have at a given frequency with what you expect if your signal was pure noise. Um, so searching for periodic components in a noisy signal. So indeed, a Fourier spectrum shows a bunch of peaks. So which ones are significant, right? I, I have a bunch, bunch of, a bunch of peaks here. That's a log scale. So actually, that one is relatively high. It's one, two, three, four, four, five. Uh, is that significant? Is that something periodic in in a, in a noisy signal? And how do you define confidence levels in terms of probabilities? You don't want to look at the spectrum and say, well, well, well that one is, that looks to me significant. I mean, you need a quantitative value. And that, you define that in terms of probabilities. What's the probability that this comes up by chance? So you, you need robust quantitative detections of these kind of things. Uh, you see many oscillatory phenomena reported in the astrophysics literature. In my field, so in the solar corona, you, you can find periods from sub-seconds to tens of hours, uh, basically anything you want. In all types of structures on the sun, you have periodic things. Uh, but several authors have shown that some of these detections should be taken with a grain of salt because of just bad practice with Fourier analysis and statistics. Also, beware of your brain eyes. They lie to you. Uh, I can see the, the pattern. I can see the period is not a statistical proof. Very often, you should realize that uh, maybe you, your PhD depends, be, depends on whether you find something or not, uh, but whatever. I mean, you should not try to fool yourself into seeing something. You need a quantitative, robust quantification of, of, the, of the presence of something in your data. Uh, I've, I have encountered these kind of things in discussing with people, uh, like preconceptions. And people saying, I cannot believe that there is nothing in my data. <laughs> it's very possible that there is nothing in your data. But I, people say that. I mean, in, the, in my field, in solar physics, people have looked for the solar 
gravitation modes, so the, the resonance mode of the sun caused by the gravitational force, and they've searched for that for 20 years. They have maybe one of the best time series of like 20 years of data every, I don't know, several times per second, uh, almost continuously, and they are still looking for that because they are doing their job properly. Several people have claimed uh, that they found the G modes, but they, and they basically only do that. They do Fourier transforms and statistical tests. Uh, but even if you believe that the G modes are in the data, uh, it's not sufficient. And, but, and, but don't, I mean, don't laugh. It's very easy to have unconscious biases. And beware of optical illusions. So finally, it's okay not to find anything in your data. <laughs> Nobody will judge you if you don't find anything. And a negative result often tells much more in science than a positive result, because you exclude lots of things uh, with a negative result, while you only confirm one thing with a positive result. Uh, you can destroy a whole theory by not finding something. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's just a little game. Beware of your brain eyes. So if you want to find a periodic signal in noise, it's equivalent to finding patterns out of randomness. So which one is random? I should have uh, put up a vote. <laughs> Any guess? No? The, the right one is random? Yes? The left one is random? No? So it usually depends. You get a 50-50 vote. So that's, that's random and that's not. Uh, so if you, if you think about it, and if you, I warned you kind of that you would be tricked, uh, this is a random distribution of points. So they were just placed here and there. And that would be the equivalent of stars. Although you tend to want to find things, even cells, you could find cells in there if you want. If you are working in some field where you must find cells, you will find cells. And your brain has been evolved to see patterns. And you will see patterns because your brain is designed <coughs> to see patterns. And this is not random because there is some mutual information between points. And that's actually a distribution of glow worms in a cave. Um, and they, do, they never approach themselves uh, too closely. So they keep some, uh, some room around themselves. Anyway, usually people are, very, are a very bad judge of what is random. And again, look at the, at the sky at night. You will see constellations. I mean, they are there. You see the shapes. It's just a random distribution of stars. Anyway, that was for fun. So Fourier transform of noise. So here I'm, ass I'm assuming a stationary process, so with constant variance. Uh, even, even though things are fluctuating, they're always fluctuating in the same way over time. Uh, so the Fourier transform of Gaussian noise, I'm not demonstrating it here, yeah, but you can, uh, you can prove that, that the Fourier transform of Gaussian noise is white, which means that you have the same power at all frequencies, hence the name white. It's the, the optical analogy. You have the same amount of power across frequencies. And something important is that the power spectral distribution of noise is distributed as, as a chi-square distribution of degree 2 at each frequency. So here, here is a Gaussian white noise time series, just noise. It's uh, Gaussian samples and its power spectrum. So that what I mean by that here is that if you consider each frequency and if you do a large number of runs of trials, then you will have various different values of the power here. And these values will be distributed. If you build the histogram, they will be distributed as a chi-squared of degree two. Uh, you can see that quickly by saying that when you take the Fourier transform, so you input a, a time series one variable that's Gaussian distributed, and you get as a result two variables, the real and the imaginary part. And you take the sum of the squares, 
And by definition, that, that's a chi-square of degree two. You sum two random normal variables, take their squares and sum them, you get a chi-square of degree two, okay? Um, so that's, by definition, you get that. So these are chi-square distribution, okay? So that's degree one here and the degree two is there. It's basically an exponential, okay? The higher order chi-squared, we don't care here. We have two variables, the real and the imaginary part that we square and take the sum. So we have a degree two chi-square. So all in all, because you have normalization factors, actually the probability at point P is basically the exponential of minus P, which is the power that the power at this frequency divided by the variance of the signal. Okay. So, oop. so here is a distribution of power for a power spectrum like this. So it's a simple experiment. You take uh, Gaussian random samples, take the Fourier spectrum, you do that n times and you, you can build the histogram and the red line is a degree two chi-square. Okay, so you can see that it will indeed match that type of statistics. Okay, it's kind of funny because the most probable value is zero, while the mean is sigma zero squared. So in it's one, the mean is here on that uh, axis. Okay. So far, so good. This is very. This is really the basics. That's the most important thing. The power at each frequency bin, and that's true also for wavelets, is distributed as a chi-square distribution of degree two. Meaning that if you do n times the experiment and you build the histogram at this frequency, you will get that distribution. That's very important because then that gives you an objective test you know exactly the distribution of power to expect. You expect something that's distributed like this. And therefore, you can compute the probability. If you get uh, this value for the power, you can compute the probability to get this value. And therefore, you can say whether or not it's likely to be due to randomness or not. And you see that, of course, it becomes less and less and less probable to have high powers Indeed, you don't have many points up there at 100. The maximum I had was four or five here in, okay? Make sense? So basically, when you compute pro confidence levels, you, will, you use that distribution. You use the degree two chi-square distribution as your expected distribution of power, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I normalize, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 indeed, indeed. It's normalized, again, it's normalized by sigma zero squared. Yes. And indeed the mean, and in the normalizations that I will use uh, later and in the hands-on, all the, all the distributions will have the same most probable value, one. So that's because of normalization, but the the important aspect to remember is that it's basically distributed as an exponential and that gives you, so you have to take care indeed of all the normalization and make sure you do things right and that you don't have a factor two somewhere. Uh, that, that's uh, left over, but uh, once, and you, and you can test your codes with simple experiments uh, by inputting like uh, variance one signals and see what you get. Um, but the, the important thing is that you have a, distribu a statistical distribution that's known and that you can compare against. So yes, I will, I will, sh I will show that later. Yes, indeed, you can, so to speak, whiten the spectrum. I will show that for non-white noise, just in the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so let's consider white noise now. So that's my white noise time series. 
And that's my power spectrum here. So the mean is one because I normalized by its variance. Okay. And I compute what I will call local confidence levels. And that's what's uh, in, that's what, uh, that's the confidence levels that are built in the Torrance and Compo code, for example. Or it's the simplest thing that you can compute. What is the probability that my signal has a power M? So it's only or simply exponential e to the power minus m. Okay, that comes from from that, and because it's normalized to sigma zero squared, it's considered a variance one in my normalized signal. So it's exponential to the minus m. Okay, so this is the probability that a given point in the spectrum is at this level. Uh, conversely, I can say, okay, what is, I want 95% confidence levels. That means that I would have only 5% chance to have the power above um, the corresponding threshold. So I, in that case, prob the probability would be 0 0.05, and I compute easily that M is actually 2.99 something. So M equals 3 in that case, okay? So if I have my mean power here, I am at three. So this is a, the usual notation, although it's very confusing. It's called three sigma, sigma being uh, the, the mean power of the spectrum, which is one in that case. So the 95% local confidence level would correspond to three times the mean power, okay? So that means that you have five, for, for a given bin in frequency, you have 5% chance to be above that level by chance, okay? So you can run that. It also means that if you do that, that experiment 100 times, uh, five times out of 100, one, that peak will be above three sigmas, okay? Just by chance. But now, if you are looking for periods in a noisy signal, you don't know usually where the frequency is, okay? You are looking, at, you may know a range of frequencies, but you don't know what frequency is the signal. That's what people who search for the solar G modes uh, are, are doing. They, they have kind of an idea of where they should be depending on the theory the frequency changes, so they look in the range of frequencies but you don't know a priori the frequency at which to expect your signal, the exact frequency. So you have to take into account the number of bins in your spectrum because since each bin of frequency has the same statistical distribution, every bin is distributed as a k-square of degree two, if you have many bins, it's like playing the lottery n times, if you have n bins, okay? So the probability that this bin is above three sigmas may be 5%, but because you have many bins, the probability to have at least one in the spectrum above the same level is much higher, okay? And indeed, you have at least a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have many of them above that level, <coughs> by chance. But then that's easy to compute the probability to have at least one bin above that level in the spectrum. So one, any one of them, any one of them, what is the probability? The good question to ask you is what is the probability to have at least one of these above a given confidence level? So you can, so P of M is the probability to be above level M. 1 minus p of m is the probability for one bin to be below, okay? The, the, because you have n over two bins, okay? You have a signal of duration n, you have n over two bins in frequency in your Fourier transform. Because the bins are, are independent, the probability that all the bins to the probability for all the bins to be below m sigmas is simply the probability for one to be above m sigma, 
to the power n over q. Okay, so it's that term. Okay, and the probability to have at least one above that level is one minus this. Okay. So you can easily compute what I will call here the global confidence levels, don't that take into account the whole spectrum. So the probability to have at least one bin above a given level in the spectrum. And you can compute M now if you set, for example, your confidence level, therefore your P to be 5%. What is the probability, what is, at what level should I put my threshold? so that I have only a 5% chance for one bin somewhere in the spectrum, at least one, to be above that level. So it's given by this expression. And so you see that, of course, it depends on the number of points. If you have more bins in your spectrum, you have, mo much, you have more and more and more probability to have at least one above a given level, okay? It's like playing the lottery n times. So if I set P equals 0 0.05, if I have 256 points, I have to put M equals to 7.8. If I have uh, 8,192, I have to put sigma uh, M at 11.3, etc. So here, um, that would be that level here. So three sigma, which is the 95% local confidence level, is that horizontal line here, and I have many, many, many points above that level, because I have many, many, many bins, more than 100. In that case, I have 8,000 points, so I have uh, 4,000 something bins. But now the probability to have at least one above, uh, the probability, the, the level at which that I should use to have 5% chance to have at least one bin above that level is 11 sigmas, and in that case, indeed, you have only one that barely touches that. But of course, if you play the experiment again, at some point, you will win the lottery. So it's only a matter of probabilities. And so what's, what to choose, uh, that's, again, there a matter of choice. Whether you consider something significant or not, um, it's uh, up to you. Um, so the important thing to remember is that your confidence levels depend on your number of data points. Okay? So in that case, I have 256 points. In that case, I have 8,000 points. The, the local confidence level is the same because the, the probability for an individual bin doesn't change, doesn't depend on the number of points. But the, the interesting probability, the relevant one, the probability to have at least one bin above a given confidence level, varies with the number of points. And that's what you see here. It's 7.8 sig sigmas for 256 points and 11.3 sigmas for 8,000 points. Okay? Make sense? And so now you can extend to red noise. Yes. The, the bins? Well, I don't choose them. They are, what do you mean exactly? Well, here it's a Fourier transform. So they are, they are defined by the Fourier transform. I don't choose them. I will, in the case of wavelets, I will go to that, but I want to make sure everybody's okay with the Fourier case because everything uh, derives from that. Yeah. Yes. Sorry if that was not clear. And, it's, and the size is varying because it's a log scale here. But the bins have the same width. It's just on the display they have varying width. Okay. Well, it depends. I mean, that has to be defined when you are talking about confidence levels. 
you may want to consider the case where you want to check a single frequency and you have an a priori knowledge, for example, of, of the frequency. Uh, what I'm saying here is that if you want to search in the blind for periodic signals, or if you don't know, let's say you know that your signal cannot be here and cannot be there, oops, but only in a, in a given frequency window, then you, can, you could use a different N, the number of bins that you have in your window. That's legitimate to do this. What I'm saying is that if you don't know where your peak is, you should just not use that statistics. That's only the probability for one bin to be above a given threshold. If you have N bins, you, you are likely to find one bin somewhere that will be above that, thre that threshold. Okay? That, that's what you see here. I mean, in, that would be uh, the 95% local confidence level for 8,000 8, data point time series. And many, many bins are above that confidence level. But it's pure noise. It's just Gaussian samples. So that's useless. You're just testing a single bin. The probability that's relevant is the probability for at least to have at least one bin above a given confidence level, not the probability for a given bin to be above a confidence level. Okay. Um, so we will verify that in the hands-on, but in the case, for example, of red noise as defined in Torrens and Compo, which they use an autoregressive one model, so a, a series that's generated using the, you know, the, the n plus one element is defined by the n element plus noise. Um, you can have a power spectrum that's not flat, so it's not white, you'll have uh, random fluctuations around, in that case, a power law. But you can show that if you had uh, infinite frequency resolution, so an infinitely long series, over uh, any given frequency range, you could consider that the noise is white, okay? If you consider an infinitely narrow band of frequency, you could consider that the power spectrum in flat is flat in that range of frequency. And indeed, if you repeat that uh, experiment, you will see that, and we will do that, um, you will see that the noise is distributed as, a k, as k squared of degree two at each frequency. So it's exactly the same as the white noise case, except that the mean is now a function of frequency. But if you divide your power by the mean, so if you normalize by that right curve, you are back to, to the to this problem, okay? So you can compute the exact same confidence levels in exactly the same way. It, the only difference is that this red curve here, instead of being flat, is, in, is a power law. So the 5% local confidence level is that dashed curve here, so that's the probability for one given bin to be above that line. So like for, like for that case, you have a few above that, above that line here and here and here and there. And then the dotted line is the global confidence level. Uh, same for 8,000 8, points. Again, you have many, many, many bins above the local confidence levels because you play the lottery n times and you win. And the dotted line is the global confidence level. And in that case, I have, I think, nothing above. Again, by chance, if I repeat the experiment, at some point, I will have one bin above whatever confidence level. OK? So red noise, red meaning you have more power at low frequencies than at high frequencies, uh, can be treated in exactly the same way. As long as you can, as you have a good estimate of the expected power at each frequency. And that's sometimes a problem. How, in real life, when you have real data, how to estimate this?
It makes sense? So now, how to find periods in any time series in three easy steps with that code? With any other code, actually. I can do it with Fourier transforms. You take a signal that has a power law Fourier spectrum. So it's very common. Uh, it's in astronomical data, it's not that common to have something that's white noise, except if you consider instrumental noise. But in that case, you, you're not observing anything really interesting, except if you're an engineer and you're interested in, <laughs> in the physics of the detector. But the, the physical signal very, very, very often has, is distributed as a power law. So it's very often that you find a red noise. And that's, that's true for many physical processes and non-physical processes. Um, so you detrend your data using a boxcar filter. That's very, you can find that very uh, often in publications. And then you apply blindly, the, again, once again, very good, Torrance and Compo wavelet package. Or more generally, you do not estimate properly the background power, meaning you don't, you don't have a good estimate of this. Or and or you trust your eyes or brain, and or you do all of the above. Uh, so that's the that's the example that Torrance and Compo give, and that will be spit out by, by their code if you run it uh, like this. They, they give you a sample code, and it will do that. So that's the El Nino time series. It's the wavelet power spectrum for the Morley wavelets. That's the time averaged power spectrum here. So it's the average of that over time. Uh, that's the average of this over scales. And the dashed line here is um, the 95% local confidence level in my definitions, even though that's called global here. But that's their terminology for what I will call the time averaged spectrum, to be, not to cause any confusion. They call that the global wavelet spectrum, while I will call this the time-averaged wavelet spectrum. And their um, contours here are the 95% local confidence levels. Uh, so did I do anything? I'm not sure. Well, OK. I will talk about that. But every bin here, the power at every bin is chi-square of degree 2 distributed like for the Fourier transform. So, which is why they can easily define these levels in exactly that way, OK? The points of the wavelet spectrum, exactly like the points of the Fourier spectrum, are k-square of deg degree 2 distributed. Here, no. That one, no, but that one, yes. That's a fake El Nino time series that I generated. I put in their code, and I get that. And that's kind of convincing. It's actually better than this. <laughs> uh, I have a big peak of power here. Uh, I have this big band of power that shows up. Uh, so it's, it's periodic. You can actually see it. You want to see it wiggles in. Yeah. But that's, pure, that's really noise in there. The input is noise. I mean, except if ideal is if the random number generator is really, really bad. <laughs> no, no, it's in that, in that case, I think I inputted white. Um, I don't remember. No, in that case, it's correlated. It's AR1. But you can do that with white noise, with decorrelated time series. It's not, not as good, but. <laughs> so uh, that's just to show you that you, can find, you will find power laws that's for the solar case, but it's, it's very common. So the, the, the intensity of a star would be distributed like this. So it's different regions on the sun uh, and a different wavelength. And you very often find a power law. OK, it's log, log. So it's a power law there. And in that region, it's white. But that's where you are dominated by photon noise. So usually, you have that shape. So a nice power law and, and then photon noise. 
So power low, white, different regions, sunspots, quiet sun, foot points, whatever. And stars would look like this. Um, and many, many other physical objects will look like this. I'm not saying that it's general or that you should see power laws everywhere. Look at your particular application and look at your power spectrum. Look at it. Uh, see what, what's the shape, what, what's the shape uh, of your power spectrum. It may be white. Uh, it may have a power law. It may be something else. I don't know. But just look at it. I'm just using power laws because it's for what I'm doing. It's very common, and I've seen that in many cases. So what are the effects of detrending? So that's, a, that's taken from, from that paper. Uh, so that's one of the, one paper using this uh, trying to find periods in, in data. So you have the signal that fluctuates. So it's basically the intensity on the sun as a function of time at a given wavelength, whatever, whatever the units. And then you run a, a running box car over that that gives you that smooth curve that you use to detrend the data because you can kind of see you kind of see that there is something going on and you say, well, I want to get rid of that and so I remove that big wiggly line, okay? Which is the resulting signal and which produces that, so that's I divided by this minus one. So it's centered on zero and it goes up and down like this. You say, okay, that's fluctuating. So what Again, when you are messing up with your signal, you, should, you can compute what you do to the Fourier spectrum. Because doing a running box car means that you are convolving your signal by a square function. That's what smoothing with a box car does. And then you are dividing your signal by this, and you subtract one, and you can compute that it's roughly equivalent to that if, you're, if the fluctuations in the signals in the signal are small, which means that you are taking, so the delta, delta S here means fluctuations while this is the signal. It means that you are taking basically the, the fluctuations minus the fluctuations convolved by a filter. So what that does is this. So I take that again and you can compute that your filter is actually has this shape. Forget this A here. So this is the shape of the filter in the Fourier space that results from doing this. So you are convolving by a boxcar, dividing your original signal by that, and subtract one. In Fourier space, it's equivalent to multiplying the power spectrum by this expression. And this is the black curve here. So it's a log-log plot. And that's the shape of the filter. So you see that it's a high pass filter, right? You remove the low frequencies and you keep the high frequencies. That's, that's, what, you, that's what you do there, right? That's what you wanted to do. You wanted to remove the low frequencies that are um, obscuring what you want to see. Okay? So now if your power spectrum, if the input power spectrum is a power low, the expected power will be psi, because it's the power law times that filter, right? And I, that's what I plotted here for different values of <coughs> alpha, meaning s. <laughs> uh, so if it's equals to zero, that's my filter itself, okay? That's uh, one, and that's my filter. And then uh, let's say uh, power law of exponent minus two, that would be the, the dashed curve here, so the orange curve there, okay? And multiplied by the filter, it gives that curve, okay? The power laws are the dashed lines, and power law times the filter is the continuous curve, okay? So that's in log-log. So in log-lin, it's exactly the same curves, but they look like this. So you see that you have kind of a, a nice peak around the cutoff frequency of your filter. And you can show that the maximum is at around this value. So 1 over delta t, delta t between being the width of the boxcar that you applied. OK? So by detrending, you created a colored signal. 
So the period that you see in the result is a real, but it's not in the original signal. It's been created because you are filtering. If you're looking at a white object through a colored filter, you will see colors. It's normal. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and here, you are not looking at a white object. You are looking at a red object, which is this. It has more power at low frequencies and less power at high frequencies. And you are looking at it through a blue filter, which is that. It cuts the red, it cuts the low frequencies. So you're looking at a red object through a blue filter, and the result is something that's purplish. <laughs> I don't know, actually, it should be black, but there is some overlap. So you're cutting this uh, slope by that filter, and so in the end, the result is that you're creating this band of dominant power. And that will produce very convincing plots, and especially something that's really bad to do would be not to look at the shape of your power spectrum and assume that it should be white, that the noise should be white because noise is white and, and it's simple because it's simple. So do it quickly and assume the noise is white. So in that case, uh, you take that signal, so it's, you say, okay, my noise is white, I can compute even local confidence levels, don't take into account the fact that you have many degrees of freedom in the, in the spectrum. Uh, I say, okay, that I just draw a straight line horizontally. Oops, sorry. I draw a straight line uh, on top of my spectrum. And so I have this, and I draw a straight line. Uh, well, it should not be there. It should be somewhere here. I don't know why it moved. But let's say I plot it at three sigmas there, and I have big peaks of power above my confidence level. But that's total garbage. Um, the problem is that it, you can produce very convincing time, time, uh, time series and pulsations. So here I have an, my original signal is the black curve, and that has a that simulated data with power law, power spectrums, power law shaped power spectrum, with an exponent of minus two. So typically something that would have a power spectrum that's like this, like the the orange curve, okay? And then I detrend it, and I get the, the magenta curve. So it's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's obviously periodic. And it, and it is. It is periodic, okay? So you can, so that's, that's, for, that's very busy, but <clears throat> we'll go slowly over that. Whoa. <clears throat> I hope you're not too hungry, but um, so that's that's that time series now. And uh, hist so again, bend your <coughs> twist your head this way. So this is frequency and this is power. Okay, it's rotated 90 degrees because of this wavelet spectra. So this is the Fourier uh, power spectrum in log lin. Okay, so it's. Power, uh, frequency in log and power in linear space. And there is an obvious peak. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, but it, it's totally normal. And so that's the same in log log, where you see a bit better what happens. So the, the histogram shaped, f forget all the other curves for now. The histogram shaped uh, curve, so the, the boxy curve is the, the Fourier power spectrum. And that follows exactly, of course, the shape of the filter that I applied, which is the cyan curve, okay? And the cyan curve is here, right? You have random fluctuations around that, but it follows, on average, the shape of the filter. So the cyan curve is, is that one in that case. It's the orange curve on that plot because I have an alpha of minus two. So by detrending my data, I created artificially a colored signal, a very colored signal, because you have a very sharp peak in frequency, because the input uh, power spectrum is a power law. So now the gray line here would be my confidence level if I assume white noise. And I say, okay, clip, okay, I have all these points that are clearly significant. And 
it's all good. Um, and that's the wavelet spectrum that you get from the torrents and Gompo code with the local confidence levels here in orange. Um, and well, again, it's clear. I mean, the input signal, because it's the detrended signal, is clearly periodic. So it will, you it will find a period. And that's, it's, it's normal. It's good. That's a good question. <laughs> The, question, the, the purpose is usually that you say, OK, I see, kind of see something, and I want to see it better. But because you kind of see something, and your brain wants to see something, something sometimes, you will choose the width of your boxcar at roughly that scale to enhance these variations. It's usually for visualization purposes. But actually, in, in the Fourier space, it doesn't do anything. Well, it, it does do a little bit. Removing, I told you before, that removing the low frequency trends will prevent uh, them from, they, they create usually a peak at low frequency. And because of the windowing function, you will have leakage of power to high frequencies. But in the case of, in these cases, where well, anyway the the, the power spectrum is red. You don't have a single low frequency that contributes. Sorry, I should go back to. You don't have a single low frequency that contributes. Uh, you have just a, a continuous a continuum of frequencies at, at low frequencies. You don't have a dominant low frequency. So for the for these type of signals, it doesn't. It's not meaningful to to detrend. It, it can be in sometimes, but in any case, you should be aware that any filtering that you apply, anything that you apply to your signal has an effect on the power spectrum. But as long as you know the effect, it's fine. You can do it. But take it into account in the subsequent analysis. So if you detrend, you know that you're filtering the data. You know that you're filtering. You, it has an effect in the Fourier space. And you should take into account that effect if you, if you want to detrend. But in many cases, at least for these cases, you just don't need to do it. People do it because they, because you get that, and you're like, OK, it shows, it shows the signal better. But sometimes it just creates fake signal. In that case, it's a, it's a pure artifact. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 You, you have to know. You have to know that uh, your filter has an effect in Fourier space, and you can take that effect into account. Mm hmm Yes? 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 Mm hmm Yes? 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 But the, th the thing indeed is that in the Fourier space, uh, except if you want, so if your purpose is to prevent leakage from the low frequency power due to the multiplication by the, by the square function, then you should detrend. But if, if not, then there is no reason to do it, because you, can, you will see, for example, if your trend is a, a sign, you will see the corresponding peak, and you can ignore it. So detrending won't add information to the Fourier spectrum. It will just modify it. It will multiply it by default filter. The resulting Fourier power spectrum will sp simply be the power spectrum of the input data times the filter. In many cases, I would advise not to detrend uh, if you are using Fourier analysis. Sometimes you need to because indeed you can you can have leakage of power to high frequencies that you may want to remove, but in, it's, it's usually at very, very low levels. 
Um, so most of the time, don't detrend first. As in, but, and if your background or the thing that pollutes your data is periodic, you will see it. And in that case, again, there is no, um, there is a trend here. But the trend, like for all these time series, you don't have a single frequency that contributes to the trend. Sorry. Um, the power spectra will always look like this. So in the Fourier space, you don't have a single frequency to, to single out. You have a continuum of frequencies. So the, these few frequencies here at the bottom will create the long-term variations, and these will create the higher, the more rapidly changing variations. But there is nothing that you can single out in there that would be, I mean, it would be totally arbitrary. Why would you cut off in there? It's a power law, it's totally continuous. So just leave it like this. And, and walk in Fourier space and interpret it like this. No. <laughs> um, ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I may need 15 minutes. We can. I can let you digest that. And we can finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a bit heavy, maybe. OK, let, I'll let you digest that. Think about it so you can come up with, with questions. And we can illustrate that with the, during the hands-on. OK, because more is coming. <laughs>